Um, so we've just heard a talk about indexed data types, and now we're going to hear about indexed code data types. Test? Okay. So, hi. My name is David Bodo. This is joint work with Andrew Cave and Brigitte Pienka. So in order to start off with index type, we'll first talk about dependent types because index types are a restricted version of that. So we've talked a lot about dependent types this week. We know about tracking invariants about programming. I won't give you the uh, vector example because you've seen it plenty of time this week. But what we can also do is do proposition as type. For example, we can define an inductive predicate uh, on natural number, saying that the natural number is even or the natural number is odd. And we do that using constructors. And then we can do proofs as program by doing writing some lemma that if some natural number is even, then its successor is odd. And for that, we would do pattern matching on the, uh, the input. And then we do the recursive call uh, for the, to build the inductive argument. So you might notice from this slide that, well, all of the example from list, natural number, the index, all of that are finite, or in, we're talking about inductive proofs. And most of the time, with dependent types, we think about inductive or finite arguments. So this is, more, this is a more accurate version of the slide, where we only talk about uh, the inductive proofs are recursive program. But then, what, how do we deal with infinite structure, something like defining streams or uh, by simulation of label transitive system, or even defining co even co-inductively. Well, if you're a, a car programmer, defining uh, even co-inductively is easy. You just say co-inductive, and then uh, you magically have what you wanted. But the thing is, and uh, but the thing is that co-induction in car is on sound. It breaks subject reduction. So it tells us that something's not quite right with that picture. So. In the question is, how do we do co-induction in a sound way? Well, there have been uh, work in the past that, think, uh, that looked at doing co-induction and doing the infinite by not thinking through constructors and laziness, but by doing observation. This is some work by Hegino and Kokat and Fukushima, where, for example, a stream is a record, and there are two fields. One is head and hell, and so to define a particular uh, stream, for example, the stream of zeros, you would you suffice us to say what each of this obs those observations mean. And then in previous work on co-patterns, we could mix pattern and observation. It's some, uh, some foundation for where co-pattern matching gives us some fun, uh, foundation for dealing with sim uh, simple uh, data types and co-data types. So this brings us to now. Now, in, the, uh, in this work, we're uh, bringing index types. So we have inductive index domain. We are, uh, it gives us a way to track properties about infinite structures. Something like stream would be indexed by uh, some natural number and give it some meaning to that. So in the sense, it extends a DML-like language. But we can also do co-inductive predicate on index domain. Something like a co-inductive even, trying to find a solution to that question. And what I'm going to show you today is mostly a core calculus. So you know, maybe the syntax doesn't quite look good, but we'll work on that in the future. So first, we'll go to the, this core calculus. So let's drop some of, the, uh, some of the syntactic sugar and have some core calculus version of the inductive even. So the even is a... Uh, Recursive data type, so it's a mu. It is indexed by some natural number n. Uh, then we have a sum of constructors, and the constructors take uh, an equation, an equality constraint that n, in the first case, n is equal to zero, and then uh, top or the unit type, because we didn't have an argument for the first constructor. And then the second one, the fall of even, so we tend to think, uh, we can think something like in Koch, and the constructor as a function from that gives us something of type even. But in this case, the constructor is applied to a product of, well, the k, which is existentially, quant uh, existentially quantified, and a proof that n is equal to the successor of successor of this k. And then something, uh, a proof of even of k. So 
how do we use that? And uh, so there's something missing here, well, in the sense that we don't uh, cover every natural number uh, possible. We only talk about the even one. Well, it does make sense, but what about talking about one or uh, some any odd number? We don't want them to be even, but we will still be able to mention that explicitly. So I'll add a line, which is a constructor, which uh, asks to provide a proof that n is equal to successor of zero and something of type bottom, which is empty. So we can never construct uh, something like even of one, but it's still there. So now using this definition, we'll think about how to do that coinductively. Well, how do we do that? We can think of um, even or an inductive uh, data type is the least fixed point. So we start with nothing, and we start with something like uh, EV of zero, and then we build up by applying a constructor and get more and more uh, natural numbers. So we get that two is even, that four is even, that, and that every even number, basically, or multiple of two is even in that sense. So if we want to do uh, co-induction, we want to dualize that picture. So then we want to take a greatest fixed point. We start with this idea of we have everything, and then we shave off what we don't want. So in that sense, we, be, uh, we get some record where the field or the observations are proof obligation, saying, well, uh, if n is equal to zero, then pr uh, prove, prove it uh, that in this case by giving me top. If n is equal to success of zero, then you better uh, give me something of the empty type. And, uh, and then there's this uh, if, if CV of successor, of, uh, a successor, then for any k, if n is equal to the successor of the successor of k, I need something, I need a proof that k is even itself. So under that picture, uh, we have this idea that each of these observations are proof obligation. Some of them will be trivially satisfied because if you talk about uh, zero, for example, then there's nothing to prove for the second and third case because, well, it's only if n is equal to six of zero. This is why it becomes a function. It becomes a like guard, in the uh, uh, the equality strain. And now we're trying to shave off something. And just in the way that for even we tried, uh, we simply construct stuff. We have something that's risk, which is not useful. We have that, C, if you think of CV of zero, we can always provide something of type unit. So we can always, uh, so it doesn't shave off anything interesting. So in the same way that EV of success of zero can never be used, we can simply omit those two things and to provide a more concise definition with only the information we care about. And there's a nice duality in the duality appears in several places. For example, uh, we start from uh, even, which is a recursive data type, and a sum, it uses existential and inequality constraints, which are the of the product. On the co-inductive side, the negative type become, uh, well, a new a record, which is a product, and then we have universals, and the equality constraint become equality guard, which are functions. So we have this duality between positive and negative types. So then, we have that those, definition, uh, those two definitions are in fact equivalent, and we can prove it in our language, and this is what we're going to do. But then, let's look at how you do the proof on paper. Let's look at the first uh, direction. So if we go from the inductive to the co-inductive interpretation, we, do that by, we can do that by induction on the input even of n. So we have two cases, EV of zero and EV of successor. And so in the case EV of zero, we have we learned that n is equal to zero. And then, like I said before, uh, all both observations are trivially satisfied because we don't have that n is equal to successor of zero, n is equal to successor of successor of k for any k. So we're done for that case. In the other case, we have that n is equal to the successor of the successor of k for some k, and we have some derivation that k is even. Then, again, we trivially satisfy uh, CV as z. In the other case, we can we'll satisfy it only if we're able to prove that co even of k. And then to do that, we simply make a call to the induction hypothesis, even of k is smaller than even of n, and then uh, we get co even of k. But this proof, in fact, can be done 
also co-inductively. Uh, and so, but the, the question is, how do we do a proof by co-induction? How do we call or do co-induction? This idea, so the proofs are essentially the same. The thing that differs is how can we use the, the hypothesis? We're provided with an hypothesis. The hypothesis in both cases is simply the statement of the lemma for all n even of n, then co-even of n. Then we have, uh, but the difference is how is in how we can use it. In the inductive case, we have the uh, dilemma holds on all subcases of the the input. So all other when you strip off constructors, on the co-inductive side, we have that it holds when you're trying to do a proof obligation when you're under an observation on the output. So. With that in mind, we can redo the previous proof, but from a co-inductive point of view. So in this case, we do uh, by co-induction on uh, co-even n. And so we have two obligations we need to fulfill. One is CVSZ, and the other one is CVSS. So the first obligation, we learned that n is equal to 6 of 0, and then we need to show bottom. So this at first can look difficult, but we can simply do an inversion on even uh, on the input, which is now the of 6 of 0. And we learned that there's no possible constructor that can be applied, that could have been applied. It's not because one tells us that n is equal to 0. The other one tells us that n is equal to 6 of 6 of k for some k. So we're done with that case. On the other case, we have that n is equal to 6 of 6 of k for some k. And what we need to show is co-even of k. So by inversion on the derivation of the input, we have even of k. And then we can use the, uh, the co-induction hypothesis. We can use our lemma because we're under this obligation. We're trying to prove CV of SS. And so we have co-even of k, and we're done with the proof. So then the question, how do we mechanize that? Because that was the goal of the exercise. So we have a function which, whose type represents the lemma. And we have that. Uh, so it, you do, we do pattern matching on the input, and we, do, uh, and we also observe the output. So for example, the first line, we, have, we introduce n. We match on EV of n uh, in the case where EV is equal to 0. We have this curly p that stands for the canonical term for equality constraint. So it says that n is equal to 0. We have uh, parentheses unit for the type top. And then we have this observation on the output because we define to define something of co-inductive types or uh, co-data type, we need to provide uh, for each observation. So now we have for the first observation, CVSZ. So the first observation asks you, us to provide a function. So we simply put the argument of the function on the left. So we have some term which is uh, of equality constraint, that's, and this is the canonical term says that n is equal to 6 of 0. And then the other cases are similar. In the second case, for CVSZ, SS, we have that uh, we introduce this variable k in addition to the proof. Uh, in the last case, we have, uh, so we have something, okay, Jay, sorry. Uh, we do the recursive call. And this recursive call is both the induction and the co-induction hypothesis because we have that we're doing the recursive call on a smaller term, which is E, which is a smaller input. And we do it on, uh, under a proof obligation because we have the observation C of SS on the other side. So proofs in our language merge both induction and co-induction. And the only this, uh, and the distinction of when you use induction and co-induction is simply uh, on which circumstances do you make a recursive call? Is it on a smaller input or is it under a proof obligation? So then let's talk a bit about uh, the theory. We, like I said, we have an index domain. The example showed the natural number as index domain, but, uh, but our theory is abstract over it. So we could use instead extra LF or label transistor system. And if you, if you want, to define a uh, user theory with particular index domain, you simply need to define terms, types, equational theory, unification algorithm, and a splitting algorithm because we have a notion of coverage. And then it needs to require, 
we require it to, be, uh, to satisfy substitution lemma, correctness of unification, most general unifier, uh, adequacy of pattern matching for indices, some other properties, and this to make sure that all meta theory that is, uh, is still maintained under the use of this new index domain. And then on the core language itself, the core language is an extension of call by push value from Levy. We, we are index core data and deep core pattern matching. It's a dependent um, core pattern matching, which uses the static equality constraint. So we dealing explicitly with uh, and solving this equality uh, in our proof to, to type check. And then we have an operational semantic, which is, uses a continuation based abstract machine. So the way we deal with function is that we can accumulate on this abstract machine, the stack, the input, and then having a uh, fire. So it gives a nice representation for it. And then we have the non-deterministic coverage algorithm and type preservation in progress. So we don't have a prototype for language and still very much a core language, but with uh, Agda, as of a few years ago, has simply typed core patterns. And those core patterns are, and the core that type can be defined using the rec uh, Agda's record. It has dependent records in the sense that the ob uh, an observation can depend on the previous one. You can refer to the previous one. But you don't have this idea of indexing where you don't represent an index from the uh, an index which come from uh, which is in the type but so if you can still simulate part of our work and our work in that sense gives a foundation for uh, playing with those idea you can simulate a work by doing uh, using defining uh, equality explicitly and then you have basically uh, program which, which should look about the same as the core version I, I gave. Uh, it doesn't give more support, so you don't shave off some of, this, uh, uh, some of the extra information we have. But it allows you to still play with this idea if you wish to, because it's kind of sweet. And so, as a conclusion, our work does uh, gives a uh, works upon a duality between the induction and the co-induction in data types, recurrent types, we have least fixed point and greatest fixed point, and even is the dual of even. And we exploit this duality through the idea of co-pattern matching, which gives a fun the, uh, and the foundation for that. Then we said, I said, well, we have some restricted version, which is index types, and uh, the goal in the future work, there's many things we would like to do in future work, but one of the most important, over maybe the next year or so, would be to define, uh, to do dependent types. And so, to do dependent types, we require some normalization that we haven't touched in language, but it's also, the most important is to do co-inductive index domain. And the reason, uh, the difficulty with co-inductive index domain relies on the equality of co-inductive terms. And this equality is, well, the equality in general is one of the most difficult problem in dependent types. And this, in particular, it's what broke subject reduction in Koch. And the question is how those infinite term, uh, you can do with infinite term that are equal. And so, yeah, I'm going to do that. So thank you very much. Questions? So Gabriel Scherer, uh, first a small remark. I'm not sure about unsound for co-inductive in Coq, because you can not have subject reduction and have a semantic soundness proof. So I, I agree it's uh, not very good, and co-patterns are much better. But I'm, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by unsound here. And then I had an actual question, which is in your example for even, to build the dual, the co-inductive predicate, you start by filling out the, the negation of even, by saying, oh, in fact, it cannot be uh, one. Uh, but in general, if I have an arbitrary inductive predicate, I may not know how to characterize the, the negation to, to do the same trick. So uh, or, or, uh, uh, do you think it's possible in general to, to build the, this co-inductive by this process that you described? 
or may there be difficulties? Maybe there is another way of, of building the dual? So for some, for some examples, it's more difficult because, yeah, the, co uh, the conductive predicate represents you're trying to say what's not uh, in it because you're trying to shave them off. Something like if you do uh, evaluation of lambda term, then defining evaluation conductively requires a whole bunch of cases of every time something will not evaluate. So in this sense, yeah, it's not uh, too easy. It's not necessarily natural or uh, something you want, because this is an example where the two are equal, but if they're not equal, something like, again, the evolution of lambda term, then, well, it might not be really useful to have this conductive version. And on the other hand, you have something where only the conductive version of the predicate is meaningful, something like divergence of lambda term, you cannot define something, redefine something meaningful inductively, so you only have the conductive one. Uh, Jasper Cox from K11. Um, so do you think it would be a good idea to add uh, indexed co-inductive records to AGDA? Or uh, do you think the version you're using now to simulate it is sufficient? I think it's a good idea to add them because so uh, the way you need to simulate it right now is you reason directly with those equality. So you need to, uh, so it gives us more cases. It's the same thing as if you were to do inductive types and you have explicitly, instead of doing using indices and uh, you have AGDA match on it, you use a parameter and then for each constructor you have this equation that n is equal to zero or n is equal to successor or successor. And then when you do pattern matching, you need to invert on those cases and, uh, and then you learn that this is impossible and you can discard the branch. Well, if you have it directly uh, as an index data type or a codata type, then you could discard the branch entirely simply by splitting because this case is impossible from the get-go. Okay. Hi, uh, Dominic Orchard, University of Kent. Uh, I was wondering whether it's possible to automatically calculate the co-inductive version from the inductive indexed version. Mm, that's a good question. Uh, Gabriel says no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if the, so one of the things with uh, the idea is that the definitions are equivalent in the, in, uh, in the cases in particular where uh, the predicates are decidable. So in the case of even, and the, uh, the proof relies on, induction, uh, on the other direction that it showed relied on induction on N because this is how you reason about uh, decidability of even. So in this case, I think it should be do doable or kind of easy because you use, you use the fact that the predicate is decidable. In a case where in comes back to question Gabriel asked. In the case where the predicate is not uh, decidable, then it's difficult to see how you can negate it uh, that way because you need to mention all those cases and there's something that fall outside of the decidable fragment. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much.